Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to see you all here. Glad to be back. Um, for me, I'm here a lot more often than you are. This is uh, kind of my second home. I'm a teacher here at Livingston and uh, very excited to, uh, to welcome you to our school. Um, but I'm also excited to be here um, sharing with you a message this morning. Um, I'm going to start with our scripture. Um, our scripture for um, today is found in John 13, verses 33 through 35. Um, and for today I'll be using the uh, New Living Translation. Um, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll see that this is in red. So this is Jesus speaking. And he says, Dear children, I'll be with you only a little longer. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm going, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How many of you, uh, and Ken already asked this, um, but I didn't, I didn't see uh, all the answers. How many of you were here last week uh, for the Love Reality Tour? So almost everybody. Um, I'm going to be sharing what I think is a continuation of what Pastor Jonathan shared with us. Um, as a teacher, uh, what you're going to hear this morning is from a teacher's mind. I'm going to relate to Jesus' message as a teacher. Um, that's why it's called the last lecture, not the last sermon. Um, and I relate to this in several ways. Jesus ministered to his disciples for three to three and a half years. Um, I'm a high school teacher. I have my kids for roughly four years. Um, this lecture was in the upper room um, at the Last Supper. After the Last Supper, Jesus talked to his disciples. So I see this as kind of a graduation speech, um, the culmination of his teachings with his disciples. He had some very important messages after the crucifixion, but this is his last talk with them before the crucifixion. And I think that's important for us to remember. I think it's a very much uh, what matters most kind of message. Um, so, as a teacher, um, I'm going to give you some homework, because uh, what I'm going to share with you today is the messages, the highlights that I get from reading um, Jesus' last lecture. What I would like you to do this evening or this afternoon, or when you have time, read for yourself John 13 through 17, that's chapters of this last lecture, and your assignment is um, to do kind of what I've done, and go through and see for yourself, what is Jesus speaking to you specifically? Um, I'm going to share with you what he has spoken to me. Um, but before we get to the meat of the message, um, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, about why this is the last lecture um, and what's so important about that. Several years ago, there was a professor by the name of Randy Pausch. You might remember um, he was on several news shows. Um, he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, came out with a book called The Last Lecture. Um, if you have not seen his speech, The Last Lecture, I would recommend that you um, Google it, YouTube. Um, it has his whole lecture. Um, and what's, what's great about the last lecture, Carnegie Mellon University is a rather um, famous university for technology. And what, he, what they do is at the end of every semester, they have a last lecture, last lecture of the semester. And they invite a very important person, a professor or, or a guest speaker. Um, and it's open to everybody, not just a specific class. Um, what's ironic about his last lecture speech was that as a um, 
the person with pancreatic cancer, it was literally his last lecture. Um, and he died shortly after, after that. Um, but what he points out uh, at the end of his last lecture is that the last lecture was not for his students. It was not for the people in the audience. Um, this book, the last lecture, um, was for his kids. And uh, as we go through what we're looking at today, this last lecture of Jesus, I think you'll see that it is not just for the disciples. It's for us. It's for his kids. Um, but I want to review a little bit of what Pastor Jonathan talked about last, um, last week. I uh, had a, the privilege of having him in my classroom. And uh, just kind of summarize what Pastor Jonathan, what I think Pastor Jonathan shared um, with us. Um, I'm going to use what's called the Golden Circle. Some of you might be familiar with the uh, motivational speaker, Simon Sinek. And he has the concept of the Golden Circle. He says, the most important thing is why. And then you get to the how and the what. Um, I think Pastor Jonathan shared very well the why of the gospel and the how of the gospel. And I, today I want to share, I think, what Jesus does in his last lectures. Um, talk about the what of the gospel. Um, let's talk briefly about the why. Um, what is the why about the gospel? Why do we have the gospel? The gospel is about our identity. How does Jesus see us? Um, and one of the things that was very profound in what Pastor Jonathan shared with um, my students, and I know he shared it with you as well, is that when Jesus, look, or when God looks at us, he does not see us for what we do. He sees us for what we are through the cross. Our identity is in Jesus. And so he sees us as righteous. And that's an important thing for us to remember. So that is our identity. Our why is that God sees us as righteous. The how um, is the process of salvation. Uh, Romans 5 through 8 talks about that um, in detail. And last Sabbath, the sermon was about the two Adams. And he talked about um, how Adam, at creation, uh, was basically uh, the one who brought sin into the world. Why? Because he's the top of our family tree. And so we inherit his nature. Um, who, who is the second Adam? Jesus. And how did he do that? Uh, it goes back to the identity. By dying on the cross, he took on our nature. And it was crucified. And so God sees us as righteous now. Um, and I want to use an illustration that my, my dad uses. Um, in explaining the second Adam, um, if I have some money and I put it into the Bible. And I send this Bible to China. What happens to the money? It goes to China. It goes to China. Why? Because it's inside the Bible. Now, since it's inside the Bible, the history of the money is the same as the history of the Bible. In China, Christianity is illegal. Everything that comes into China is checked by um, censors. And uh, so it comes into the post office. They see that it's a Bible. They don't deliver it, but instead they burn the Bible. What happens to that money? It's burned. So the history of the money is the same as the history of the Bible. The same is true of us in Christ. The history of us is the same as the history of Christ. When he ascends to heaven, when he is seen as righteous by God 
That's our history. We are seen as righteous by God. Um, and so to use like another, a term that my dad uses, is it clear? Is the gospel clear? Do you understand what this means, the two atoms? I'll do something I do with my students. Give me a thumbs up if it's clear. Do you understand what the two atoms means? That our history is the same as Jesus' history. So I'm going to go through this whole lecture of Jesus, and I want to highlight what I see as the main points that Jesus is speaking to us, but I want to start with what I think is the central theme of this whole lecture, and I see it in John chapter 15, verse 17. It's a very short verse. It says, this is my command, love each other. That's the lens we're going to be looking at this whole sermon lecture through, through the lens of love each other. What exactly is Jesus trying to tell his disciples? So first, <coughs> let's start with chapter 13. So John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and one of the things I think is important for us to understand is that when John wrote this, he did not write it using chapters or verses or even subtitles. Those have been added, um, and so that's going to make, um, make some interesting uh, transitions that uh, should be there that are not implied in, in reading um, through this lecture. So John 13, I'm going to chunk verses 1 through 17 together. And if you look through verses 1 through 17, just glance to them. We're not going to read uh, the whole section. But I am going to focus mostly on verses 12 through 17. But what's happening here in verses 1 through 17? What's happening in the upper room? Yeah, so I want you, in your mind's eye, to imagine what's happening here. Um, they've gone through Passion Week. This is Thursday night. They've experienced the triumphal entry. They've seen some pretty amazing things. Um, they've come through some pretty big disagreements recently. Specifically, uh, John and James asked their mom to talk to Jesus about where they sit on the throne next to Jesus because they want to be the greatest. They come into the upper room and uh, in renting the upper room, everything is there ready for um, the Passover meal. But they only rented the room. They did not rent a servant with the room. And so when they get there, um, they've been traveling. Um, so they stayed in Bethany this whole week, but they're doing everything in Jerusalem. What's the distance between Bethany and Jerusalem? It's kind of like Salem-Kaiser. If you look on Google Maps, you'll see that Bethany is just south and uh, east of Jerusalem, not that far especially by car, but they're not traveling by car. They're walking, dirty roads, sandals. And so it's tradition in um, Jewish culture um, that when you have, especially an important meal, like a Passover meal, that you wash the guest's feet. They're clean. There's no servant to do that. So Jesus just sits there watching what happens with the disciples, or what happens. They kind of jockey for where they sit. Notice who sits where. And there's two specific individuals that are pointed out as to where they sit. Judas and John. Where does Judas sit? 
on one side of Jesus, the left. John is on the other, on the right. Um, and they're sitting there. Jesus gets up. He takes off his outer garment, puts our, the towel around him, and comes to wash the disciples' feet. What's their reaction? They're a little shocked. Because this is not um, an activity for a master to do. It's for a slave or servant to do. Going down specifically to verses 12 through 17. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord. And you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I think the first message that I get from uh, this last lecture that Jesus starts with is servanthood. As followers of Christ, we are to be servants. We're not to be served. We are to be the servants. Then in verses 18 through 30, um, kind of talks about, um, in my Bible, it has the um, subtitles, Jesus predicts his betrayal. Um, what he does there is he actually makes sure the prophecy is fulfilled. He <coughs> sets Judas into motion um, his plan. And uh, what is Judas's plan? Yeah. He has gone through this week. He's a little upset at what Jesus is not doing. And so uh, he sees himself as greater than the Master. Verses 33 through 34 include our scripture. So I'm not going to read um, that part. But I do want to focus down um, the last part of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14. What's interesting is that sometimes because of the change in chapter, we see this uh, there, as, a, as a, a line drawn between the two chapters. But this is a flowing conversation. And I want to uh, talk about what this flowing conversation says to us. So I'm going to read from verses 35, chapter 13, verse 35, um, all the way through chapter 14, verse 4. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Going back to that central theme of love one another. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come with you now, Lord? He asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, Die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. That you, or you will deny that you know me three times. Continuing the conversation, Jesus says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If there, if this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get get you, so that you will be always you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I'm going. Sometimes we see this as just a an isolated conversation conversation between Jesus and Peter, but he's talking with the whole group, and what's happening here? He says to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Don't worry about it, because I'm going to come back and take you home. What message does that have for me? It says, Chris, you're going to make mistakes, but that's okay. I see you. God sees you as righteous. I'll come back for you and take you home. 
And that's a, that's a huge encouragement. The very next verse um, that I want to look at, or the next verse I want to look at is um, John 14, uh, verse 15. John 14, verse 15 um, says, If you love me, obey my commandments. To me, this is one of those cart and horse statements. Which goes first, the horse or the cart? The horse. the horse goes first. In this sentence, what which goes first, the love or the obedience? Yeah. And too many times in our human nature is to flip that around. Um, to do the obedience to receive the love. But that's not what Jesus says. If you love me, then obey me. And that's an important sequence. In other words, he's saying you need to live the identity that God sees you as. And I think that's uh, valuable information. And he starts here what I'm going to call a subtle theme of fruits or works. Um, because he brings this up um, a few times later on. Continuing on through his lecture, John 14, 16 to 26, he kind of has an introduction to the Holy Spirit or the Comforter. Um, and then in verse 27, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Um, I think that's just an enc another encouraging lesson from, from this lecture. Continuing on in his lecture, John 14, 30 and 31. Um, one of the things I, I teach in my health class, I use in my health class, is Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Does anyone know what habit three is? Habit three is first things first. In other words, priorities. And in deciding what first things first, what your priorities are, Stephen Covey says, um, you should use the Eisenhower decision matrix. But the Eisenhower decision matrix works like this. Um, two columns and two rows. You have an urgent column and a not urgent column. And you have an important row and a not important row. The cross hairs between urgent and important, we need to do, and we need to do it now. Um, quadrant two is the not urgent, but important. And those are things that we need to decide to do. We need to make those our priorities. We need to schedule a time to do those. Um, and then we get down to the bottom, the not important, and oftentimes, the not important are things that distract us. Um, if it's not important but urgent, um, things like a phone call or notifications on our phones, uh, the notifications make it seem like they're urgent, but most of the time they're not important. But we distract, get distracted from our lives by focusing on what pops up. Um, and then quadrant four, is uh, not urgent and not important. And those things we need to eliminate from our lives. So where is Jesus in John 14, verses 30 and 31? He's in quadrant one. He's saying, I don't have a lot of time, and this is very important. It's urgent. It's very important information for us to know. Um, and it's it's powerful. Thank you. Um, as we move on in his lecture, uh, let's go to chapter 15. And in verses 1 through 8, we again see this fruit and works theme. Uh, there's an old song he used to sing in the Sabbath school uh, about... I'm the vine, 
and you are the branches his banner over me is love I don't know if you remember that song um, that's kind of what this um, these verses are talking about um, and we see again here um, in verse 4 uh, he says remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me what exactly is Jesus talking about here he's going back to his his subtle theme of fruit or works I want to go back to the the point we made before um, if you love me obey me and we often talk about that obedience as the fruit or the works of our Christian lives um, what is Jesus saying here in this context <coughs> Are these works our own? If we're the vine and he's the branch, or sorry, if we're the branch and he's the vine, we're, we're allowing him to flow through us. So the works that people see, the obedience that people see, is actually seeing Jesus through us. And uh, that's, again, a very important thing for us to remember. Continuing on in his lecture, John 15, verses 9 through 17. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Three main points I get from this part of Jesus' lecture. Number one, remain in love. That's where we got to stay. Jesus transitions us from servants to friends. He confides in us like friends. But also, we need to produce lasting fruit. Moving on in his lecture, chapter 15, verses 18 through 16, verse 4, Jesus talks about how the world hates him, therefore, it's going to hate you. Again, that goes back to the money in the Bible illustration. The history of the money is the same as the history of the Bible. If the world hates the Bible, and we are in the Bible, if we are in Jesus, then and the world hates Jesus, the world's going to hate us. That shouldn't be surprising. John 16, 5 through 15, he talks about, again, the Holy Spirit and the role of the Comforter. And then in verses 16 through 24, um, he gives an illustration that as parents, it's a little easier to understand. Um, becoming a parent is, is an amazing experience. Um, and, and Jesus talks about how um, labor pains are very painful, not a fun experience, but they're temporary. Joy in having a child does not is not encompassed in the labor pains. It's having the child and them living out their life. And we will have abundant joy, like most parents feel about their kids. John 16, 25 through 31, he talks about the father-son bond, about how God and Jesus are one. If you know the son, you know the father. I want to focus here on um, the end of his lecture now, 
The whole of John chapter 17 is a prayer. And uh, you might consider this a benediction. This is Jesus' benediction for his last lecture, for this graduation speech. Um, and I want to focus specifically on verses 20 and 21. John 17, verse 20. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for those who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. So what's Jesus saying here? Going back to the last lecture, the original last lecture, Randy Pausch, um, the message was not for the audience, the message was for the kids. Jesus is saying here, the message is for the disciples, but not just the disciples, for all of you who believe. He's speaking to us here as believers later on, who ever believe. I want to close with John 17, 25 and 26. Our righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. So my conclusion is that God's love for us is the same as God's love for Jesus. And that we are to live in Him. So the why, the how, the what of the gospel, I think can all be concluded in one word. And that is love. The theme of the last lecture. So I want to, I want to end by saying this. Live loved and love strong. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Sabbath. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace and your amazing love that you've given to us freely. Lord, thank you so much for the awesome plan that you put in forth to save us um, because you love us. Lord, thank you for your great love. Um, and Lord, be with us now as we go into the rest of the week. Lord, just help us have a blessing today. Uh, keep us safe and bring us back here next week. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.